Hey guys. So we reached the end of the class. And now we are going to be talking about the smallest of all the entities that at the outset of the class we said were valid, the only valid entities that can be used in historical explanations, and therefore the only valid entities that you can use in your paper at the end of the semester. Persons, you, me, John Travolta, Elgorn Hover, are real. Some of them are crazier than the others. But we are real. We are not just a mere product of our society. Sure, as we're born, we're socialized in the family. We many values having to do with the culture to which our families belong are passed on to us. Without our choice, we simply accept those values at face value, as it were. And then we go to school, and between the socialization that we achieve with our little friends, plus the authority of the teachers and so on, we are given farther cues as to what it is to be what is obligatory and not obligatory in our society? This is the way we learn our mother tongue. We already talked about that in another class. Mother tongue is obligatory. A baby might start <coughs> mimicking the sounds that come out of his or her father's or mother's mouth, but in the end, a baby or a, a, a toddler realizes that it is obligatory to speak that mother tongue. It is not, you're not imitating things like you imitate little movements and little games and mannerisms of their children in kindergarten. So that sense of obligation clearly socializes you and clearly changes you. Does that mean that we are a mere product of our society? No, it doesn't. We emerge just like every other entity in this class from the bottom up, from soft personal components. And yes, then we become part of families, part of uh, organizations like schools, part of communities uh, and, as, as we said, emerging holes emerge from the bottom up, but they also act back on their components. So part of that acting back, part of that constraining comes from the community that we're born in. You have to respect the local norms of your community. You have to, you know, reciprocate favors and, 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 and keep your promises and, and pay your bets and so on. Don't say lies. And they, we then we become part of organizations and we have to follow rules. But that is just part, every entity that we've talked about has that double causality. It emerges from the components that it is made out of, from the interaction between the components, but it is also constrained and enabled by the larger holes to which it is holes, to which it itself is a component part. So to that extent, clearly, social entities, not society, because there's no such thing as society, but with concrete social entities, concrete communities, concrete organizations, concrete cities and so on, do affect us from the top down. But we also emerge from the bottom up, clearly from something that has to be so personal. Beliefs, desires, sense impressions, feelings, and a variety of other soft personal components which interact within our mind to make us emerge. So the question now is, how can we explain that emergence? How can we explain the psychological self? How can we explain you and me, not our physical bodies, because our physical bodies are explained by embryology, the process that unfolded the fertilized egg inside your lungs and eventually created the baby. That is what that, and of course the evolutionary process that led to the creation of the human species is what, is what uh, accounts for us as organisms and as species in both cases. It's a historical process, nine months inside the womb, six million years evolving from the last common ancestor to chimpanzees. It's a history of very long, very short, but nevertheless historical. What we want to know today is how our minds, and not so much our minds, but our subjects, Self. The guys that, that, that wake, they go to sleep one night, dream all kinds of bizarre things, and wake up, you're not a different person. Right? You're basically the same person who just went for a roller coaster ride and it's all like, oh my god, what was that dream? It's a pretty stable entity. <coughs> and we 
you're going to find out why I'm waiting, which is, of course, being destabilized. There's two main traditions that we can draw on here, and they are, to a certain extent, mutually exclusive. It's a tradition that begins with David Hume, on one hand, they're both contemporaries, late 18th century philosophers. The other one begins with Emmanuel Kant. We may be able to trace this back to Greek and, 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 and perhaps Roman philosophers in part or, or, or in whole. It doesn't really matter for us right now. We don't want to make a full history of everything that has been said about the mind. And before I start, I need to say this. Nobody knows what the mind is. If somebody tells you that they already know, they're lying to you. It's still the holy grail of philosophy to discover what conscious experience is, how this virtual reality that I have in front of me, because I'm the only one who has this view right now, everybody's looking in this direction. I'm the only one that sees the door, the exit. I'm the only one that sees all of your faces. So clearly, this exists only for me right now. None of you has this. So the question is, how does this emerge? out of this virtual reality that I'm constructing right now, this point of view, this unique point of view, emerges. And how is it maintained? Because something emerges, but then it has to be maintained on a day-to-day -day basis, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, by the continuous interaction between components. That is true of communities, it's true of organizations, it's true of cities, and it's true of egos, or psychological selves. So having said that, Nobody knows. First of all, that's a relief for me. I don't have to right now pretend that I have a secret. But I can I, I think we can at least make a map. Make a map of our options. It is possible that the mystery will be solved this century. It is possible that the mystery will be, will, will be solved by someone in your generation. So but the very first thing we need to know is to make a map of the alternatives that we have had so far and see which ones we choose, which ones seem more reasonable, more, more closer to the truth, and of course, which ones are more compatible with materialism. Because if after everything we've gone through in the last nine lectures, I come, out, I come out right now with a theory of the mind that doesn't in any way fit with materialism, well, that would be a huge hole in the theory, wouldn't it? Before I explain in detail, what human can do, and then I'm going to the plan of the class is basically this. I'm going to try to explain this. That's on the board right now. And then, of all the possible ways in which you can approach the mind, that is all the, all the different schools of psychology, which is a discipline that, that specializes on that, I'm going to pick robotics, cognitive psychology and robotics. Why? Because in robotics, what you're trying to do is to get a mind to emerge. And so the human mind, but it's something like an animal mind. So that the robot can be autonomous, can be actually perform things by itself, just like a dog performs things, actions and so on, and who is able to explore space all by itself. But you need to have that mind merging. Since we are in the business of emergence in this class, that seems to me, artificial intelligence seems to me the best way of illustrating this thing. This is all we're going to do, right? We're not going to solve the mystery of the mind. I already told you that from the beginning. You don't expect me to do that. I'm not a miracle worker. But we can map our options and then give the best illustrations we have for what those options are right now. I could, of course, go on, talk about psychoanalysis, which was one theory of mind, Piagetian uh, development and psychology, which is another theory of mind, a cognitive psychology, behaviorism. I mean, there's got to be 10 or so different schools of psychology. We could spend the next four hours just describing what each one of those schools does. We're not going to do that. I, I, I have a strong belief that there's basically just two options. And of course, within those options, there may be many sub-schools, but those two options are the ones that we need to decide right now which ones are we going to do. Which one of those two options we're going to go for? Which, as materialists, remember, I didn't say that I was going to convince you to be materialist at the end of the, of the class. All I was going to do is make it something that is likely, so that when you write your paper, you can write with confidence as a materialist, even if you abandon this particular stance once the class is over. Before I do this, then, let me give you an image that is basically contains this thing, but 
in an image as an icon, and that is all we need right now. It is said, and I've never double checked this, but something like it might be true, that Eskimos have 29 words for snow. The number is irrelevant. It can be 29, it can be 20, it can be 19, it can be 15. It's just many words for snow. Now we know that skiers have at least seven different words for snow. And skiers don't live in snow. Right? They, they have like sport that depends on snow. So it's more powdery, is it more liquidy, you know, and, and probably the seven names have to do with the ability of snow to, 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 for, to allow you to do the things you do when you ski. But if they have seven words, then believing that Eskimos have 29 words is not a big deal. So the question now is, do Eskimos see 29 different kinds of snow because they have 29 words for snow? In other words, the words come first, and then the words inform your perception in such a way that now you have 29 categories to classify snow, so you can say, oh, that belongs to category number one, that belongs to category number two, because you have the categories, and without the words, you would not be able to see any kinds of snow, except just snow. Or, word number two, Eskimos have 29 words for snow, because they see, smell, touch, build igloos with, hunt, get lost in storms of 29 kinds of snow, right? Door number one, words come first. You are born in a culture that has 29 words, you are taught 29 words, and now you can, in other words, perception is classification. To perceive is to classify, to understand something is to classify. If you don't have a, if you don't have a category, it's a pigeonhole, you cannot put anything in the category, so the words have to come first. And there may even not be 29 kinds of snow. For all you care, snow doesn't even exist. All that there is is appearances of snow. Snow as it appears to our senses. On the other hand, you have non-linguistic practices, building igloos with snow, hunting on snow, uh, pre, you know, telling your kid, don't eat the yellow snow. Why not, Daddy? Well, think about it. How did it get yellow? Oh, because you do things with snow, right? Because you act on snow, you intervene causally in snow, whether because it's supporting your weight when you're hunting, because, it, it, because it's a storm and you want to know the type of storm or you know where you're going to get back. And in particular, for architects, you build stuff, igloos with snow. That means that you're touching it, that you're sensing its, its coherence as a, as a brick, that you, are, that, that, you're, that, that you are actually intervening causally in reality. And, there, and, and therefore, you end up with 29 words for snow. What happens would be, I mean, the, the, the scenario would be this. Any culture for whom something is anything, cars, swimming pools, snow, is a particularly important thing in their lives, tend to develop many synonyms for that. Think of the number of synonyms we have for cars. Uh, and when you have many synonyms for words, when synonyms tend to proliferate, some of them will tend to disappear because they are basically the same word set with in different, in different, in the same meaning expressed in different words, unless they acquire subtle shades of meaning and begin marking subtle differences. So after a while, you begin with a bunch of synonyms for snow, and you end up with 29 words for all those all those slight distinctions in, ma in the materiality of snow. Now, what is snow? Snow is just, of course, frozen water. But water can freeze as snowflakes or as ice. And therefore, different kinds of snow will form depending on the, the proportion of solid water to liquid water that it has. Like slushy uh, snow, dry snow. Snow will also be powdery. If it's made out of mostly snowflakes, but it will be more crystalline and therefore tend to form clumps and, uh, uh, of, of, of ice at whatever size, if it's dominated by ice. Because of the actual physical aspects of snow, there are many different kinds of snow. And more importantly, the different properties of the different kinds of snow affect you as an Eskimo in different ways. Let me let me, let me introduce a distinction that we're going to need here. 
distinction between the, the physical properties of something and the capacities of something. Imagine a knife. We used a knife as an example in a previous class with the edge being rigid and the body being tough. Now let's think about the edge. Remember you have triangular cross-section. With a triangular cross-section, the knife has the property of being sharp. And that is a property that it has all the time. On this is blunt, of course, but as long as it's triangular in cross-section, the, 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 the knife is uh, sharp. Now, one way in which we classify things is by that. We classify the knife as sharp or as blunt. We classify it by their properties, just like we were classifying snow right now by the proportion of crystal versus snowflakes in it, or the proportion of water versus solid in it. Those are actual proportions, physical properties. We also classify things by what they can do. So, for instance, the case of the knife, we know that the knife not only is sharp, but it has the capacity to cut things. Now, capacity is different than a property. Because right now, I may have a knife in the back of my pocket, it's not cutting anything. And yet, the capacity is real. The moment I take a banana out and go right back, it'll slice right through. I'll take an arm and slice right through. So a capacity is something that's real, but that it only becomes actual when it's exercised. And it needs to be exercised relative to something that has the capacity to be affected. So a knife can cut lemons, can cut bananas, can cut meat, but it can cut a solid block of titanium, and it can cut through ceramics, and it can cut, cannot cut through glass or even crystal. Something needs to have the capacity to be cut for this needs to be a cutting tool. And so we classify knives in different ways, not only as sharp and blunt, but also what they have different capacities to cut. This is a good, uh, this is a good knife for cutting incredibly tough things. This is, this is a good knife for chopping. This is a good knife for peeling. So we classify things both by their properties and by their capacities. In the case of snow, the 29 words would have emerged by when we interact with that snow, we not only know that it has certain properties, it's a little, it's a little too soft, it's a little too hard, but also by its capacity. This particular type of snow is good for building igloos. It can be used for construction purpose. This small kind of snow cannot be used for construction purpose. So, even the variety of properties and capacities is no object properties and capacities of material snow, then we end up with 29 words for snow. So let me just remind you of what the two possibilities are. Door number one, we see 29 kinds of snow that may not even exist, because for phenomenology, the world does not exist independently of our minds, remember that. So snow does not exist independently of our minds. And we give snow its it, you know, we, 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 it, it, it's placed in a system, a taxonomy, by classifying it under 29 categories that we inherited from our parents. The wor words make the world. Words give world its order. If my experience right now has any coherence, and it does have, because if I turn around and real fast, everything is roughly the same, it's stable. The coherence of this is given by the coherence of language. Door number two, the coherence of things is given by themselves. They themselves have point of equilibria, they themselves have point of stability, they themselves have capacities and properties. And we interact with them with our bodies, with our senses, and we, we, we cause things to happen in those things by intervening in reality, not just contemplating it and classifying it. And when you interact with things on a daily basis and your living, your livinghood, your, 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 your survival depends on knowing about all those different capacities and properties of snow, well, you end up with 29 words for snow because it is, they're good mnemonic devices. You can teach them to your kids, right? And they don't, you know, and now, you know, they are armed with those, with those, with those mnemonic devices. So in both cases, we have language. The question is not so much whether language is important or not. It is important. The question is whether language constructs or informs perceptual reality, or whether perceptual reality has continuity with that of animals, 
and language simply comes in as an extra added tool that does not necessarily affect my perception of reality. That option is basically the option between these two. Hume would side with the 29, the 29 words came after the 29 properties of snow, and what mattered was all of our senses interacting with snow. And of course, perception is not linguistic. Kant and his followers would say would hold to the thesis of the linguisticality of experience, and therefore to the thesis that our experience is drastically and completely different than that of dogs, cats, dolphins, and other animals that don't have any language and don't have any linguistic categories. <coughs> Hume would affirm that there's a continuity with the perception of mammals, with the perception of birds, with the perception of, you know, farm animals and so on. We, Kant would say that there's a definite and drastic Kant. In Hume's world, you need the world to exist because that's the one that's the world that's producing sensations. In Kant's world, you can actually say the world doesn't even exist. All that exists is language, the categories that it creates, and the way it informs what I perceive. Throughout the class of the last weeks, I've been fighting against this position. Right? I've been trying to give you all the reasons in the world not to believe these guys. But as a point of fact, Kantians won the 20th century. If you just count the number of philosophers in the 20th century, put a list of all the philosophers in the 20th century, and then put it in one of these two categories, the majority would end up being Kantian, one way or another. Yes, there are humans, particularly in the analytical philosophy tradition, the Anglo-American tradition, but many Anglo-Americans are Kantians. Yes, humans are, uh, scientists tend to be mostly humans. They have to, right? they have to believe that what they're studying is real. But nevertheless, there are some, some scientists who are also Kantians. Overall, Kantians won, or at least neo-Kantians. Let's then talk about the specific. Let's start over here. For Kant, the subject, the self, psychological entity that we call our ego, is defined by two capacities, intuition and understanding. The, the, the words that I underline, I'm going to tell you in a second why I underline them. Intuition refers to the capacity to perceive particular entities. For instance, right now, I'm getting a sense impression from that, which is two black surfaces with some kind of chrony uh, wiring around it, and some kind of brown surface that's kind of a perpendicular to one of the two black surfaces. That's all I'm perceiving. But I'm not perceiving a chair, or, or you know, a, a, a particular, right? an object that's good for sitting on and writing on. In order for me to then take these pixels, the sense impressions, and, and see them as a chair, I need to have the category chair in my head. I need to understand the meaning of the word chair, and once I, or chairs in general, and once I understand that meaning, then I can use my faculty of understanding and classify those, that, those particular impressions that I take from this angle under the general category chair. So, categories organize perception. And therefore, you don't even have to believe that there's a world that exists independently of our minds. Since categories, they, well, and this is particularly true once we go to the Neo-Kantians. In the 20th century, the basic some ideas were used by Heidegger, Husserl, uh, most of those modern philosophers believe in the linguisticality of experience. A long, you know, I'm not even going to start giving names right now. A, a majority of philosophers believe that perception is basically linguistic. We call them neo-Kantians. Because unlike Kant, for whom the general categories we were born with and were transcendental, in the 20th century all general categories were thought to be arbitrary conventions. We already saw why. You know, the, 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 the string of letters snow refers to the white stuff in English, but it's a completely different string of letters in Spanish, nieve, that refers to the white stuff. And you go to French, and it's a completely different word that refers to the same white stuff. Every language has its own words, and it's, some, and it's an arbitrary string of sounds. 
There's nothing about S N O W that makes it refer to snow. So then this arbitrariness became the basis for relativism. If, if we all create our experience via words, and there is not a world behind that experience, and finally, if every culture has different words, well then every culture lives in a different world. And, which is, you know, you might laugh. But this is something taken very seriously by anthropologists. Many anthropologists who buy into the linguisticality of experience think that literally live in different worlds. You need to actually join the culture, learn their terms, learn their language in order to be able to understand what they see because they in fact see an entirely different thing. They can actually make assertions that are just downright ridiculous, such as if there are cultures that only have only have two words for color, say one for dark colors and the other one for light colors. That culture literally sees things in black and white. Now that's something that can be very easily disproved, right? You show up with a bunch of letter set colors or even with your computer for God's sake, so in Photoshop showing your palette with all the little colors and begin to, 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 to say, well, point to something that is what your word for dark color is. Is this other word also like that? Is this a, and then you can, it's very easy to teach a, a tribe that only has two color words, more color words, because they all have color perception, for God's sakes. They all see oranges and greens and reds and blues. You don't need to have the words to see the colors. But nevertheless, we spent the entire 20th century thinking so. What a waste! We need to take the 21st century back. This, of course, leads directly away from materialism. It, 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 it distracts you of it. It doesn't even allow you to think about all the non-linguistic practices that people do, like building igloos. You know, you stop at how they classify things, and that's it. That's the most important thing in the world. Everything non-linguistic that they do is unimportant because it's guided by their categories. So Kant was a genius. Nobody's going to deny that. Nevertheless, he led to Neo-Kantianism, which is a very crappy theory. And yet, it dominated the 20th century. It's something that we would, it's an obstacle that we would have to remove in order for us to advance at all. Now let's see what Hume would say. It's a very different thing. Remember, Hume emphasized the continuity between animal and human perception. He did not think it was a drastic cut. Between, you know, when your dog looks at you, he's looking basically what you would see if you were a dog. And, and if you're a pet owner, you know that your pets know things and move around the space just as if you were moving around space, even though they don't have language. So if we don't have language, then what do we have? Well, according to Hume, and here I want to use Jill Deleuze's version of Hume, just because it is the simplest and more direct. Jill Deleuze, which is about a philosopher I have not mentioned at all throughout the semester because I'm trying to stop talking about him, is the main materialist historian of the 20th century. There is simply no other like him. There is a, a strong a, a materialist a, a philosophy dating to Marxism, dialectical materialism, <coughs> historical materialism, but nevertheless, because that both were based on an a priori schema of morphogenesis, the negation of the negation of Hegel, it turns out that you couldn't really fit everything into a Hegelian straitjacket, and in the end, he just died of old age. So what Deleuze did was to basically renew materialism for the new century. So the very first book, and Deleuze is French, everybody knows, and if you're French, you're continental, almost by even if, if being continental means buying into what Germans say, better buy from Germans than buy from Brits, right? If you're French. So, to write your very first book, the very first published book on Hume, was a warning by the Lutz. It's like, here I come, and I'm not French people. Okay, I'm not going to stick to everything that everybody who's French sticks to. I'm going to start writing on Hume. 
then he wrote a book on Kant, where in an interview he said, I wrote a book on Kant, as one writes a book on an enemy. I cannot, I cannot think of better, clearer words than that. So, the subject in a Deleuzean Union approach emerges literally as a crystallization, as, a, as, a, as something that, that, that uh, coagulates in a field of raw impressions, of raw intensities. That means both intensities of color, intensities of smell or aroma, intensities of flavors, intensities of sound, intensities of texture, intensities of temperature, I feel cold, I feel hot, intensities of pressure, okay? you know, intensities of density, I just came from the, from the countryside and I'm, and I'm in Penn Station, it's packed, you immediately feel the density. And all those are intensities because it can be a very mild call or a very saturated call or a very, you know, a, 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 a low sounding sound, a very high, you know, very high volume sound, very low pitch, very high pitch, very uh, subtle flavor, very concentrated flavor. All those are intensities. And in addition, internal intensities. The intensity of pride that I feel when we're sitting on pride, the intensity of humiliation that I feel when I get fired from a place. Believe me, I, I know about that. Intensities of love. I'm a little in love. I'm really much in love. Intensities of hate. I, kind of, I don't like this guy. I like to kill him and, you know, cut his head off and, well, you know. This comes in intensities. And what varies is the intensity. And I'm not saying that this is a, a, a full list. I'm saying that there are all kinds of feelings that are not sensations. They're internal, and many, many of which are in fact social. Pride and humiliation do not exist in animals. You cannot humiliate an animal. But they are very important for us because we saw that this is, this is how communities manage to enforce local norms via ridicule and ostracism. If you cannot feel humiliation, People laughing behind your back. It's like, I am, I must be funny because they're laughing behind my back. You know, you're going, to, you're going to be one of those ridiculous proof people, and people are trying to ridicule you by laughing behind your back, and you're going, Hey, what is that? Am I not funny? Yeah, yeah. But if you can feel humiliation, people be laughing behind your back, it's a major deal. And if, and if you can feel pride and helping your community and being celebrated in your community as, a, as somebody who helped your community makes you feel proud different intensities. So for us to fit at all within a community, we, all, we need these internal intensities as raw felt intensities. Forget about the fact that they have a word. You cannot, you may, you may have never been taught the word humiliation, and someone humiliates you, and you feel humiliation. It doesn't matter if you call it boogaboo. Uh, 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 Hume also talk about not the raw intensities themselves, but also the low intensity replicas that we use to memorize those original sensations. Those right now, if I ask you, do you know what pineapple tastes like? You're probably going to say yes, right? Even though you could put it into words, try to explain to me what pineapple tastes like. Well, it has a pineapple taste. Right? But if so, someone gives you a bite of pineapple, you go, yeah, this is pineapple, this is not mango, this is not coconut. Right? So we have memories of this, of this <coughs> sensations. We, have, we know what red means, we know what blue means, we know what bitter means, we know what salty means. We know what all those words means because we have low intensity replicas of the original sensations that we have. Someone that never tasted salt doesn't know what salty means doesn't matter what he or she says. You need to have experienced it. So, we have sensations, internal and, and external, that come in different intensities. And then we have low intensity replicas of those sensations that, that Hume called ideas. Now the question is, how do this raw field of intensities, that's totally disorganized, acquires the, the order that I now have in front of me? Here, order comes from the order of language. Order is derived from the word orderly taxonomy. The taxonomy is what gives this, the stability of taxonomy is what gives the stability to my, my sensations. Here, you don't have a taxonomy. 
So where does it come from? Well, it comes from habit. It comes from routine. And more specifically, it comes from making habitual connections between things that are contiguous in space, routinely, things that are contiguous in time, I see that always when this occurs, this always occurs right next to it, routinely, and things that are similar to one another, routinely. We begin with the first one. Imagine that you're a baby, and as a baby, of course, you're filled with impressions entirely delirious, because it's just like colors and sounds, and, and you cannot really group them into, into, into tasks. And one of the first things that you begin to recognize is your mother's face because she feeds you, and she loves you, and she makes you feel protected, and when you cry, she protects you. Now imagine if, you, if your mother's face one day came to you, and she has eyebrows, where everybody has eyebrows, and eyes below the eyebrows, and a nose below the eyes, and lips below the nose, and you see the contiguity relationships one day, but the following day your mother comes, and the mouth is here, the nose is over here, and it has eyebrows, like instead of, instead of a mustache, you know, as a baby, you would totally freak out, right? But also, you would never be able to remember your mother's face. You would never be able to actually say, you know, this is an order set of figures, an arrangement, a pattern that I can recognize the following day. You recognize it because in reality, the eyebrows don't move around. The nose stays in its place. It's a matter of physical truth. The mouth tends to stay below the nose, in most people anyway. And so you begin, as, you begin to see it as habitually in those relations. Eventually you come to see it as a coherent thing. And you build your world entity by entity. The baby as it begins, as it becomes a toddler and begins moving around, is going to discover all kinds of things that he had never seen or she had never seen and begins to discover relationships like being on top of, being underneath, being behind, being in front. And he discovers all that by exploring real space with its little body, by like crawling around, moving behind, crawling behind, moving in front, exploring, discovering new things, and habitually discovering connections. The second type of connection is what we call causality, this linear causality. If every time I push like this, the thing moves, I come to believe if the following day I push the thing and the thing moves, or I grab the thing and the thing comes with me, and I grasp the next thing and the thing comes with me, and you know, I know that I can wrap my hand and have a cause of effect and then bring it towards me, by the 10th time, 20th time, that becomes a habit. You now know that there is a certain regularity in causal relations. Every time I light a fire, I put a piece of paper, the piece of paper goes on fire. Well, fire causes, you know, a flame, an open flame causes something to go on fire. You learn about causality. And causality is very important for the Eskimos that have on this side, because of course they are intervening causally in the world. They're changing things by operating on the world by intervening in it, by changing it. But you need to change it observing the regularities in the world, depending on what effect you want to achieve. So, spatial continuity, that can become a habit, and can one entity at a time, not your full field of perception, start become coherent. Continuity in space. And finally, resemblance. Resemblance is a very tricky notion, but nevertheless you can see that things are, are, are similar in color, or things are similar in shape, that things are similar in, in, uh, in size, that some things are big, some things are small, and that certain small things you can do things with, a large thing you cannot do that. And even though similarity is a very vague notion, it's a very useful notion for organizing the world. So, an entirely different theory. There's not a single word here. Not a single word. You don't need words. You can be deaf, dumb, and blind. Don't even hear me. You know, something like that. And you can still feel humiliation. You can still feel pride. Of course, you're going to see some color, aroma, flavor. But 
You don't need words to organize your world. What you do need is habitual activity. You do need to have certain routines. And it's those routines that are going to give the world a certain coherence. Now, before I move on to artificial intelligence, obviously, let me put it this way, needless to say, a materialist is going to tend to side with Hume. I have to say right off the bat that Hume was not a full materialist. For instance, for Hume, the match did not produce the fire in the paper. All that Hume says is that habitually we see one and then we see the other. But he doesn't believe that, there's a, that we can theory and have an actual process through which the, the, the open flame caused the fire in the paper. I believe that you can theorize an open process. A transmission of energy for God's sake from one to the other that makes the, the paper go on fire. So Hume wasn't a full materialist, but clearly he's closer to materialism than this guy is. If we're discussing only subjective experience right now, it doesn't really matter that, that uh, if. So, but just to finish this, if a subject is an emergent crystallization, in other words, if what, what, if what was there when you were a, a newborn baby was a wild field of intensity, with colors going each way, with sounds going each one its own way, textures of different types, changes of temperature, the proximity of the body of your mom, and it goes away, or it is cold, and so on. And you don't know what causes it, you don't know because you're a newborn baby. Within that wild field of intensities, your ego begins little by little crystallizing, literally like an ice cube in water, like something that that agglomerates or coagulates those, those intensities, and now you can say, this is my perception. But prior to that, you couldn't say, that's my perception, because you were immersed in that world. So, as with everything that we said in class, if something emerges, then it can also disappear. If, for whatever reason, the components that are interacting to make you emerge start interacting in a different way, you, the subject, the self, the ego, should be able to melt down again. That's not a possibility here. It doesn't. Does the subject disappear? Well, <clears throat> I have a friend who has a friend who tells me that there are some substances out there. I wouldn't know anything about it, and I say this to the camera with a straight face. <laughs> Uh, the friend of my friend calls them magical plants. Mushrooms, peyote, LSD, which is a fungus. I don't know what even those words mean. I mean, I believe me, I'm like, yes, I'm, a, I'm a little virgin. But the friend of my friend is very experienced with this. And according to him, after ingesting a small dose of mushrooms or peyote or LSD, actually a large dose, <laughs> Your ego literally melts away. Now, what does that mean? It melts away. Does that mean that, you, that then you go unconscious? That you become unconscious? No. The impressions are still there. The reds, the greens, the, the banana flavors, the, the, the pineapple aromas, the, the rough textures, the, the smooth textures, the hot, the cold, the high pressure, the low. All those intensities are still there. They're just not being brought together into a coherent perception. They become a delirium. Now, magical plants, you know, and I've been telling a friend of my friend, man, you have to stop doing that. Because that's probably bad for you, and I'm telling you that to you guys too. Don't do this at home. Magical plants are not the only ones that the way to do this. Madness of different types does this. There are several forms of schizophrenia, a, 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 a manic a depression, a variety of forms of madness, or even things like a simple, uh, one of those uh, isolation chambers, you know, seen, you know it's like uh, little vessels, little pods that are filled with very saline water, so that when you float in, you don't feel gravity, you're kind of floating in salt, and they are soundproof, lightproof, Smell proof and all proof. So you go into one of those things, it closes like a, like a sarcophagus, and 15 minutes later you go into a delirium. Cabin fever. A fever
fever more than 105 degrees delirium. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I could list the number of ways of destabilizing your ego. You can destabilize it, and yet the intensities are still there. What does that tell you? That they are not your intensities. That they do not belong to your ego. They belong to your mind. But the mind is a different thing. The mind is this delirious thing, out of which, out of habit, out of routine, an ego crystallizes in the middle of it. That ego can be lost if you can produce a state of delirium by whatever means. And I'm not saying that you should do this. All I'm saying is try it if you don't believe me. So, Hume has also been recently given some more evidence in favor by our discovery that memory can both be, it can be autobiographical memories, memories of things you actually lived. You know, you were in that wooden cabin in the, in the, you know, in, 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 in the middle of a forest, and in front of a beautiful fire. Uh, there was this beautiful music playing. Uh, the, the smell of jasmine drifted through the open window. You went, my God, what a beautiful perfume. And you now remember that scene as if you were there. It was say, it happened ten years ago. Now every time you listen to the same music, every time you are in front of a fire, even if it's not that beautiful cabin, every time that you smell jasmine, the entire scene comes rushing in. Right? Everybody has had that experience of remembering a very powerful, very intense, a very rich autobiographical memory by by. By, it, it, it triggered by a symbol of the stimuli, the sound, the smell, the vision, something that seemed like it, or even the same person that you were with. You haven't seen him in a long time, and you go, remember when we were in that cabin in front of the fire. So autobiographical memories are different, are recreations of your original experience at a much lower intensity. It's not as we recreate your original experience, but at a lower intensity, you're recreating all the intensities and the assemblage of intensities. And in addition to that, we have semantic memory. We remember what we read, and we remember what we have been told, even if we didn't live it. That those two things are different has now been proved by, by the study of different types of amnesia. Clearly, it is unethical to cut pieces of human brains to try to figure out where the thing is. So you have to wait for a car accident or some other lesion that's, that's, that's uh, natural or at least not deliberately caused uh, for that to happen. But now we have enough cases of the different types of amnesia where you can lose completely your ability to recall autobiographical memories. And but remember everything that has been told to you and you remember everything you've read. In other words, you remember that someone told you yesterday that today the doctor was going to talk to you, but you don't remember who, or at what time, or the scene in which he was told. <laughs> or vice versa, you get a lesion in your brain in which you can actually remember everything that actually happened to you, but you cannot remember, for the love of God, what they told you. Right? You cannot remember linguistic stuff. So now we start, you know, we start to have laboratory evidence that shows that Linguistic memory is different than autobiographical memory. And that is evidence in favor of Hume, not in favor of Kant. Right? For Kant, that distinction shouldn't even exist. Everything is linguistic. Everything is just a matter of taxonomy or categorizing under a general type. Everything for the Neo-Kantians is a matter of language. So, before I go into artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence, by the way, just to announce what's coming up in a second, has followed these two lines exactly. There's two schools of artificial intelligence, one Kantian, called the symbolic school of artificial intelligence, and one Humean, or connectionism, or neural nets, which about which you probably already heard a little bit if you went to my lecture on Wednesday. But I'm gonna give you a little more, a little more data on that. Before saying that, though, let me bring another person that we 
coming in here, we finish her. His name is Erwin Goffman, a sociologist, but he's a micro sociologist. And among the many books that he wrote, he wrote a book that works on very simple interaction rituals, such as conversations. He convinced and argued that a conversation, say, between four or five people in a corner is, in fact, a ritualized activity. First of all, once everybody has, has identified one, first of all, you have to be with your bodies, and we're talking there, you know, it's also called force phone conversations and internet and Skype conversations. Let's forget about high technology for a second here. Let's talk about conversations because they have been for like a thousand years. So, you have to have your body oriented towards the center of where everybody is, you know, in the same orientation. People don't converse by putting their asses in front of them. You have to, once everybody has ratified each other as members of that conversation and passed their by, they're kind of like, it's kind of like eavesdropping. You can go, hey, hey, are you part of this conversation or what? Keep on walking, man. In other words, it excludes all the people around you. Now, it, everybody has ratified so that's part of the dynamical system. The dynamical system now is running. And, he says, the main intensity in that dynamical system is precisely pride and humiliation. Pride and humiliation on your public persona. Your public persona is that aspect, is, is the way you present yourself to others. In most cases, our public persona coincides quite a bit with our real ego. In other words, if you are somebody who's funny, you present yourself in your public persona as funny. But if you don't, if you can't tell a joke at all, and, and, and you always forget the punchline, and, and, and you, you get the order wrong and so on, you don't try to project that persona as a funny guy because they're going to discover you're not a funny guy in about three minutes, right? But nevertheless, your public persona doesn't necessarily have to coincide and almost never coincides with your private person, with your private person private self, because you hide your weaknesses, or at least you minimize exposing your weaknesses, and you try to give a little boost to your strengths. You know, you try to present yourself as a little funnier than you are, you try to present yourself as a little more courageous than you in fact are, you try to present yourself as, you know, because that is a public person you're trying to project. As I said, you cannot depart too much from your real self because you are, you're going to get caught, and then that is worse. But you present something that's a little better with the weaknesses kind of ameliorated or attenuated in the way you present them. Nevertheless, every time you have a conversation, it is your public persona that's being presented. Nobody has access to your mind. People don't read minds, so they don't know what you're really thinking. You are right there with your public persona. And if, for instance, one person makes a revelation about you that nobody knew, Oh, so, so, so you didn't know you was a virgin? And everybody starts laughing, right? Oh, wait, wait, I'm not strictly speaking a virgin, am I? You know, you're talking to your hand. Uh, you, you, you get embarrassed, you're like, like totally, you know, flustered, and at that point, you begin communicating the embarrassment with the rest of it, except perhaps for the, for the, for the idiot who called you a virgin in public. Everybody else gets embarrassed that you're embarrassed, and the conversation stops. After an awkward silence, it just falls away. And it stops because in a conversation, attention is the most important element. People need to be paying attention. It's a turn-taking type of thing. And every, every person that has a turn, you pay attention to them, or at least pretend to pay attention to them. So that when it's your turn, people pay attention. Attention is a type of labor. We already talked about a little bit about this when I talked about penny newspapers. And I said that they were the first ones to sell the attention of readers to advertisers. If you can sell it, then it's a kind of labor. And so you, it's, a, it's a form of energy that's circulating around the conversation. When someone gets embarrassed and communicates that, that embarrassment to the rest, there's a critical point of embarrassment beyond which people cannot continue to pay attention to the conversation. They are too distracted about thinking, a 40-year-old virgin, oh my god, you must have really good computer games in your house. <laughs> Conversations need a certain number of skills. They need tact. 
You are not supposed to make revelations like that about other people. And they, they, they need poise. If someone reveals something about you, you better don't get all fluttered and river. You know, you better take it, you know, to roll with the punches. That's what having poise is. So yes, I'm a virgin, but that's because they have very high standards. Actually, I don't even know how to recover from it. I'm a virgin <laughs> then. So I can perhaps use a different example. So I just made a different revelation, but if you have poise, you make a self-deprecating joke, everybody laughs, and bingo, attention is now. Turn away to the original subject of the conversation, the conversation can continue. If you get all flustered, and then, you know, you distract everybody, you embarrass everybody. Now, this is the guy to be for conversations. You might seem like it's a minute thing, but it isn't. Because we saw communities only survive from the day-to-day -day interactions of the emergent properties of communities only continue to exist as long as there's day-to-day -day interactions between persons. And one of the most important day-to-day -day interactions between people in a community is conversation. So let's not disregard God's man. Plus, it also gives us the public half, the public half of yourself, which is important. And because it's all about intensities, if it's beautifully with human, a conversation is an assemblage. It's an assemblage that may be very ephemeral, in the sense that you guys get together, have a conversation for half an hour, and then it goes away, and then maybe another conversation. But nevertheless, ephemeral social assemblages are important particularly if they are practice, if they recur every day. So, Erwin Goffman needed to complement <coughs> Hume. Let's now talk a little bit about how we can implement this in computers. The easiest one is, of course, Kant. Right. AI, artificial intelligence, Kant, symbolic artificial intelligence can be traced directly to Kant. The two words that I underlined here was general and particular. General and particular are linguistic or logical categories. You can have a general sentence, all humans are mortal. You can have a particular sentence, I am human. Those are logical or linguistic concepts. And of course, if, you know, if, you, if you're a Kantian, you believe that I don't perceive particulars, but I only understand them when I categorize them under a general category, when I, when I, when I place them under a general category. So, symbolic artificial intelligence is all about the general and the particular. How, in particular, how do you move truth, for instance, from general sentences to particular sentences? Our age, our symbolic artificial intelligence it has a long tradition because it goes at least back to the very first piece of software ever written. It was not exactly software because it didn't have computers, but it was a step-by-step -step mechanical recipe. So it was an algorithm and therefore is software. It's called the syllogism. And the syllogism invented by Aristotle was a hit. For 2,500 years, Kant thought the syllogism was the main, one of the main examples of synthetic a priori truths, just up there with Newton's theories and Euclidean geometry, meaning he thought it was a big deal, a huge deal. Hegel, who came after uh, Kant, but it is part of the same German tradition, also has an entire chapter on the syllogism. So the syllogism was a huge deal up to the advent of computers. Here's an example of the syllogism. All humans are mortal. Socrates is human. That's the input to the algorithm. You feed it these two sentences as an input, and the syllogism will automatically give you as an output Socrates is mortal. Now I'm sure that you're thinking right now, really, you know, wow, what a shocker, right? Socrates is mortal.
mortal was already in, implied in there. So it's not that this was a big deal. It doesn't look like a big deal because I only have two premises. But now imagine this thing with 30 premises and try to keep them all in your head and try to keep and try to come up with the right response after after you hear 30 sentences, you're gonna give me the conclusion. You can't do that. The syllogism can. So it is an algorithm, it's a mechanical recipe that moves truth and falsity from general sentences to particular sentences. That's what deductive logic in general is. And symbolic artificial intelligence is partly based on deductive logic. Deductive logic is a set of mechanical recipes to move truth and falsity from general sentences to particular sentences. So when, when Aristotle wrote the syllogism, he was already writing a little piece of artificial intelligence. He invented deductive logic, that is, he formalized it and gave us the first little piece of software that actually works mechanically and infallibly. So that's deductive logic. Artificial intelligence is basically representations It uses representations, linguistic or otherwise, and manipulates it, manipulates them via or through logical rules. Now we just saw one type of logic, deductive logic. It moves truth from the general to the particular. There's another type of this actually right back down here. When I say truth, I mean truth and falsity, right? I just don't want to be writing that over and over again. From the general. to general, you have invented 
a program that learns from experience, because that's what it is. From experience, I know this, this jewel is green. From experience, I know this other emerald is green. From experience, I know this emerald. All emeralds are green. Now you have generalized from your particular experiences. There cannot be anything more Kantian than that. So in order for us to meet the Kantian paradigm, we need to solve the problem of inductive logic. We haven't yet. The closest that artificial intelligence has come to do that is via all <coughs> expert systems. <coughs> Although in the 1950s they made great attempts, this was by the way at the Rand Corporation, we mentioned the Rand Corporation, they filed before it. But a think tank. At the Rand Corporation, this guy called Herbert Simon, a very clever guy who has done both economics and, and artificial intelligence and has his hands on just about everything, he created something called a theorem prover. Now, theorems are things that you derive from axioms. This, this thing of Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry has a few axioms, a, a few truths that are self evident. And from those self-evident truths that you cannot, and you don't have to prove because they are self-evident, you can derive many theorems deductively. The axioms are general, the theorems are particular. <coughs> so, but if, if within an axiomatic system, like say Euclidean geometry, you can then take a theorem and prove that it follows from a general a, a, an axiom, then you have done a little bit of an inductive logic. It's is a very constrained form of inductive logic because it only allows you to learn within that system of axioms, but nevertheless you move truth from particulars to generals. You move truth from theorems to axioms. Uh, that's called a theorem prover. And, and, and the first one, the first successful one was designed in the late 50s by Herbert Simon at the Rand Corporation. Despite that, people in the artificial intelligence community realize this is not going to fly. There may not be general algorithms for inductive logic outside of axiomatic systems. You know, inductive logic may not be a matter of algorithms, but a matter of heuristics. Which is just a fancy word for rules of thumb. That is informal rules that tell you what to do in certain situations, but are not generally applicable. So heuristics, unlike algorithms, are not always right. You know, when an algorithm, we, we were taught an algorithm, we, we were taught how to multiply numbers like this, 23 by 46, as kids. Right? The very first thing they did is they crammed into our heads the multiplication tables. We were all, as kids, had to be repeating 2 by 2 is 4, 2 by 3 is 6, 2 by 4 is 8, right? And it was by repetition, we eventually learned how to say those numbers over and over and over again. That is similar to, to doing a transfer of data into your head. We just don't have the means to download things into your head, but if we could, you could do different things. If you would download with the multiplication tables, because they, instead of having to memorize them by rot. But after that, they show you a mechanical recipe. First take the right hand number, multiply it, it's 18, you carry a number, that's 13. Then take the second number and move it over one, that's 12. That's 9 if you carry the number, and then add the numbers. That's, that's a step-by-step -step recipe that we learn as kids, and that's an algorithm. So algorithms don't necessarily have to run on computers. It can be any mechanical recipe that's infallible. As long as you follow that recipe step-by-step, -step, even if you don't understand why you follow it, it will give you the right result. But many things we do in life are not infallible recipes. They are recipes, but they are basically informal rules. They work in this case, maybe if I alter them a little, they will work in another case. So, artificial intelligence people decided to try to build inductive logic via heuristics. But where do you get the heuristics? Well, you get them from actual experts. So what they did is to cheat. They invited, this is in the 1960s, the first two expert systems 
where one that had to do with medicine, it was how to diagnose within a very narrow range of diseases, diseases by their symptoms. That is a kind of inductive logic. A patient comes to you and says, I have a runny nose, I have a slightly high fever, I have a, you know, and it gives you a list of, 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 of them. So then you go from that particular case to all the particular cases that you've seen and you go, you have the flu. You belong in the general category flu. Or if you want to put it this way, the patient has runny nose, the patient has a, a, a slight fever, the patient uh, sneezes a lot. There's a bunch of particular truths. The patient has the flu as a general truth. You know, as the, the patient belongs to the category people with flu. So diagnosing diseases is an example of inductive logic. So what expert systems did is hire an actual doctor and try to extract from that doctor, try to force him to verbalize his know-how. Doctors normally learn how to diagnose. They don't really learn it in a book. It's a skill. And like with all skills, it's typically one verbalized. We already talked about that. But you can force him to verbalize. You put him in front of a bunch of video cameras, a bunch of tape recorders. Someone called a knowledge engineer is there with a questionnaire and saying, okay, I'm going to present you with some symptoms. I want you to classify them. Yes, this is easy. This is a yellow fever. But what, what steps did you go through to, to, to do that? I don't know. I'm a doctor. Well, try to verbalize. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put your mind inside a computer and it's going to be an internal being. Oh, okay, okay. So then you finally extract the heuristics from the doctors. A painful process. It takes weeks to do that. And you end up with a bunch of sentences that are like this. If, then, else. And a bunch of if, then, else sentences, which all together are, are called a knowledge base. And they codify the informal knowledge, the informal heuristics of an actual doctor. And then using these heuristics, then you get the computer, you test the computer with a bunch of symptoms. This guy came with his symptoms, what disease does it have? The computer almost always get it right. Expert systems work. If you go to the artificial intelligence section of your library or artificial intelligence section of of your bookstore, you're going to find several volumes on expert systems because they're still developing. They actually work. They perform inductive logic, but in very narrow fields. So they are more like idiot savants than they are general intelligent people. In other words, an expert system knows about medicine in a few diseases. We can ask them about architecture, ask them about engineering, and they don't want to know anything. So they are more like super specialized idiot savants. But within their field, they work. And so this is as close as the molecular artificial intelligence has gotten to deciphering the mystery of inductive logic. Now because we humans have both autobiographical memory and semantic memory, we need this. It's not as if we could it's not as if we could discard Kant altogether. Categories, the gender, the relation between the general and the particular, everything that Kant studied is important. But it's important only for one of our types of memory. Semantic memory, linguistic memory, and our linguistic activities. Everything having to do with lived experience has nothing to do with language. So then how do we capture that? 